This is Terry Beatley, your host of What If We've Been Wrong? I'm shining light into some dark places so that beauty, goodness, and truth defeat the schemes of the enemy. It's true, people are perishing for lack of knowledge, and we're instructed to have nothing to do with the evil deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. That's what I do on What If We've Been Wrong? Rethink, explore, and uncover some hidden truths so that more people can experience an abundant life and the joy of being set free from the shackles that hold us in prison. Welcome to What If We've Been Wrong. Lies, 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 and more lies. I am so tired of lies. What am I talking about? Senator Dianne Feinstein didn't just misquote during the Judge Brett Kavanaugh Supreme Court justice hearing. Senator Dianne Feinstein lied. She so grossly misquoted the number of women who had been supposedly dying due to illegal abortion back in the in the 50s and 60s prior to Roe v. Wade. She told um, she's what she quoted in this hearing was that 200,000 up to 1.2 million. I mean, you talk about a spread. 200,000 up to 1.2 million women in the 50s and 60s had died due to illegal abortion. America, that's a bald face lie. How do we know that? Even the pro-abortion uh, Guttmacher Institute, even they quoted numbers far, far less than that. We're talking about numbers like at the most like 200 uh, women a year, according to Bernard Nathanson, who co-founded what we call today NARAL Pro-Choice America. He said on the high side, it was 200 women per year. Many times it was significantly lower than that. Bernard Nathanson, as the spokesperson for NARAL uh, back in the late 60s and early 70s, he would tell the media a bald-faced lie. He would tell them 5,000 to 10,000 women a year are dying due to illegal abortion. Uh, knowing full well that the real number was uh, at the most 200 women per year. So as a woman, I'm so tired of women politicians, most particularly on the left, and we've got a few on the right, but particularly the, the, the women on the left, uh, particularly you know the women who are for legalized abortion, these politicians, they are duping women. They are lying to women. And and what's the fallout of it? We now have we now live in a culture where millions and millions of people deeply, deeply grieve having made that decision to kill their child years ago. Maybe they were a teenager. Maybe they were back in college. Maybe it was just the wrong time they thought economically. But given enough time, millions of people realize that they made the most horrible decision. Because this is not just a woman's right to choose, as Diane Feinstein said, because she asked Brett Kavanaugh, she said, do you agree with Justice O'Connor that a woman's right to control her reproductive life impacts her ability to participate equally in the economic and social life of a nation? Well, let, let's rephrase this question, Let's let's because we're talking about abortion here. So she said, do you agree with Justice O'Connor that a woman's right to kill her own offspring impacts her ability to participate equally in the economic and social life of a nation? Well, well I'm going to spin that. Let, let's, let's spin, because what she really wanted him to say, of course, is, well, absolutely, he agrees with Justice O'Connor. Now, this is me talking. Let's talk about the economic impact and the social life impact of our nation as women choose to kill their own babies. Nothing destroys peace more than the decision to kill a child. Nothing destroys national peace any more than the laws on the books allowing adults to kill children. I don't care where that child's located. He could be poor, black, in an inner city neighborhood. Or that little child could be um, 12 weeks old in his mother's womb. That little child, whether being born into a rich or a poor family or middle class, has every bit right to a life than, than the next child who, who might be born into a poor, into a poor neighborhood, a poor family. In inner city, 
in an apartment versus, you know, a, a countryside, you know, palace. It's, we've got to get back to the basics. So let's go back and address this question, the economic and social life of the nation. You cannot remove, you cannot kill 60 million babies. And that's what's happened since 1973. For those of you who think, oh, you know, abortion's bad and it happens some, but most people give birth to their babies. We've now lost 60 million children. Those people would have grown up to, uh, let's see, work. And when you work, uh, what do we do? They put money into the social security system. Um, but we've removed 60 million people. And those 60 million people would have invented, many of them would have invented new products, new services, provided new jobs. They, it could, they could have been the next um, Bill Gates, you know, with the next billion dollar industry, employing thousands and thousands of people all across the country. They could have been the next inventor of the next high tech product. Or that person could have been, you know, the local uh, charming, smiling, down syndrome person who everybody loves in their community because that little, that person has not a care in the world, um, but they smile and they just bring light to a community. Uh, as what happened in my local community. Uh, now let's talk about the social life. You talk about a social life of women who choose to kill their own children? Really start digging into this. When you give women long enough time to, um, uh, I guess you'd say, assimilate what they've done, many, many women have either grown to become very angry and hard because they're trying to defend their, their decision years ago of, of making the decision to abort, to kill their own child. And that's a horrible thing to have to face. But hey, they were told it was legal. They were told it was just a blob of tissue. They were told that, hey, it's their right to choose. But nobody told them when they walked into Planned Parenthood or any of the other you know, choice of, of abortion mills that a number of different things, that you may grieve this decision because this is a human life. This is a baby. Uh, nobody told them that it jacks up their chances of getting breast cancer. And if you don't believe me, just go to the Breast Cancer Prevention Institute or listen to another podcast that I have posted on, uh, on America Out Loud where we explain the science behind the connection between the rise in breast cancer and legalizing abortion. There's a direct connection, has everything to do with estrogen, because the best defense of breast cancer is a full-term pregnancy, particularly your very first pregnancy. Well, which pregnancies are usually aborted? It's usually going to be uh, the young woman's first pregnancy. And so um, it, we, we see the connection with all the psychological trauma of women. So again, we're talking about the social life of a nation and, and the economic impact. I mean, we now know that abortion has driven so many women into depression, into drug abuse, into alcoholism, into very uh, destructive lifestyles, promiscuity, anything to help either smother the, the feelings that they're having or this hard, cold, angry, um, you know, feminist kind of um, persona uh, that's now so rampant. Uh, because you've got this billion dollar abortion industry which keep, continues to spew all these lies building you know building generations of women who want to defend this quote right to kill a baby well I say Justice O'Connor was absolutely wrong and Senator Dianne Feinstein was absolutely wrong to to lie to mislead uh, the American public because, quite frankly, if I was Diane Feinstein and I had so grossly misquoted, it's, it's one thing if she had said, well, the estimate is about 300 women a year had been dying of illegal abortion. Well, that would have been way over the high side, you know, by 100. But this woman is saying, you know, like 200,000 to 1 million women, she's a 1.2, had died over that 10-year period. So she's saying 100,000 women a year, bald-faced lie. You know, what the real numbers were were, were about... 100,000 women a year were having illegal abortions and about 200 women, 150 to 200 women were dying per year uh, due to illegal abortions. Most of those deaths 
were due to botched self-abortions. The vast majority of women back then who were accessing illegal abortions, they were still going to doctors. And quite frankly, the majority of the doctors were performing that procedure and the women survived. Uh, but keep in mind, every single baby lost his or her life. So don't ever think that um, that, you know, as we throw these words around abortion and Roe v. Wade and all that, somebody always dies in an abortion. The question, you know, to Diane Feinstein is how many people are dying? We, we know the baby dies. Now, Diane Feinstein, can you, can you please get your data right? So evidently, a staff member had passed her a piece of paper, and that's when she had shifted over and she said, you know, I don't want to go back to those day, to those death tolls. And I truly believe women should be able to control their own reproductive systems. The other point I want to make is when she talks about women controlling their own reproductive systems, they have a chance to control their own reproductive system. And it's called keep your legs crossed. They've got that choice. They don't have to be going to bed having premarital sex because the vast majority of abortions are happening with women who aren't even married. We did not look like this as a country prior to this whole push for Margaret Sanger, radical feminism, the whole push of promiscuity, uh, Alfred Kinsey, which ultimately, um, which ultimately unleashed this whole cultural revolution, which led to, you know, the Roe v. Wade decision and then these other abortion uh, court cases. So, so the, the, the other thing I want to make in this first segment is let's do a quick review of this woman that we call Roe. You know, they keep going, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade, Roe v. Wade. Does anybody really know? Uh, well, I know some people do, of course, but the vast majority of Americans don't even know who was Roe, who was this woman. Well, her real name was Norma McCorvey. Norma McCorvey, uh, she was in her young 20s, I believe it was early 20s, and she was homeless, she was pregnant, and she had heard about this thing called abortion. She did not know what it was. She did not understand that it kills an existing human being, you know, who's already in existence, not, not, not a future life. She did not understand that an abortion literally stops the beating heart of an existing human being. That person is small. That person's in the womb. But, but she just thought, in the words of John Wayne, and I'm, I'm, this actually comes from her affidavit that she filed with the Supreme Court 30 years later after Roe v. Wade, where she was petitioning the Supreme Court, begging them to overturn, to reverse the Roe v. Wade decision. Because she's explaining to the court 30 years later that she didn't understand what she was doing and that she had been used and misled by two pro-abortion activist attorneys, Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey. Uh, but, but in the words of John Wayne, um, Norma McCorvey thought abort, like abortion, abort means to go back, to go back to the situation of not being pregnant. She did not understand that it kills the life of a human being. Here are some of the other important facts that you may want to know about the Roe v. Wade case that, again, the vast majority of Americans do not know. Norma McCorvey, she was homeless, um, that she had had a drug problem. And uh, she, when she, when her life intersected with these two attorneys, they took her out, they met her at a pizza beer joint, got her drunked up on two to three pitchers of beer, and they got her to sign, well, not literally sign on to the Roe v. Wade, but got her to agree to be the plaintiff in the Roe v. Wade case. Now, why is this key? Well, interestingly, they, they had to serve her beer, okay, to, I guess, loosen her up or whatever, or to help dupe her. Um, and, and appeal to probably the, um, you know, problem that she already had because she already admitted being an alcoholic and a drug addict. Okay, so Norma McCorvey uh, agrees to be the plaintiff, not even knowing that uh, an abortion kills the life of a child. And here's a quote uh, from bullet point number nine in her 2003 affidavit. She said the attorneys uh, during the meeting said, Norma, you know, don't you think that abortion should be legal? Unsure, I responded that I did not know. In fact, I did not know what the term abortion really meant. Back in 1970, no one discussed abortion. It was taboo, and so too was the subject of abortion. The only thing I knew about the word 
uh, was that it was from the war movies and again like John Wayne to abort to go back she just knew she wanted to go back to not being pregnant she did not understand that the baby was already formed in her womb she didn't understand that uh, that it that it kills the life of an innocent human being the attorneys told her that that oh it's only tissue they told her it's only tissue. This is a quote. It's bullet point number 14. My lawyers never discussed what an abortion is other than to make the misrepresentation that it's only tissue. I never understood that the child was already in existence. I never understood that the child was a complete separate human being. So again, they so confidently, these pro-abort uh, politicians, I think they so confidently figure that that the public will never ever learn about the true story behind Norma McCorvey which by the way if you go to my website uh, with the, the nonprofit organization I have called Hosea Initiative that's H-O-S-E-A initiative it's www.hosea4u.org H-O-S-E-A you can put the number four y o u dot o r g hosea for you dot org. If you go down to the bottom of the home page and you click on the Roe v. Wade affidavit, you you will see Norma McCorvey's affidavit from 2003 uh, petitioning the Supreme Court to overturn the Roe v. Wade decision. Okay, now Norma. Oh, oh, the other big thing, that's right, she, uh, let's see, wh when they do meet again, she only met with the, with the attorneys. You, know, you think about the, the most, um, uh, the most di divisive case in Supreme Court history, you know, which has led to the death of 60 million Americans. I mean, y'all wrap your heads around that. 60 million Americans have lost their lives because of Roe v. Wade. Uh, Norma McCorvey only met with the attorneys two times. So the first time was over pizza and beer, and the second time was to sign the Roe v. Wade affidavit. Now let's get the law straight. When you when somebody signs the affidavit, they're signing that 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 they agree that everything is correct in the written affidavit. Well, Norma McCorvey did not read the affidavit, and her attorneys Sarah Weddington and Linda Coffey knew this but but coffee and Weddington submitted that affidavit to the court anyways so Norma McCorvey didn't even know what was in that Roe v Wade affidavit so they drunk her up in meeting one and then in meeting two her attorneys broke the law and we're coming right back in a few minutes we're gonna be going over a few more important facts about Norma McCorvey trying to overturn the Roe v. Wade decision. We're going to be talking about Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the six erroneous assumptions in Roe v. Wade. I got a great talk for you today, so uh, don't go anywhere. Stay right there. I'll be right back. Well, the out loud perspective awaits you in life, love, politics, a healthy lifestyle, your faith, personal development, and living an out loud life on AmericaOutloud.com. Blitz your news and entertainment network where you can listen 24-7 on our free apps on both Android and Apple. Welcome to the new era in communications, America Out Loud Talk Radio. Okay, now I want to pivot over to the six erroneous assumptions the Roe v. Wade court made. Uh, back in 1973 and we'll try to dig into each one of these issues at length and the, the and this actually comes from an appendix in my book called what if we've been wrong keeping my promise to America's abortion king uh, his name was Dr. Bernard Nathanson he was the founder of NARAL which today we call it NARAL pro-choice America it's a pro-abortion political activist organization and Dr. Nathanson, he admits to unleashing this eight-point propaganda campaign. I'll cover those eight points in just a few minutes here. But first, I want to cover, though, the, the eight-point, I mean, the six points of erroneous assumptions the Supreme Court made in their decision. The first one is that we cannot know what a human being is and when its life begins. That's what the court said. 
that the unborn child is not a living human being. That's, that was their assumption. But of course, now we know that life, and this is all proven scientifically, that life begins at conception. There, I mean, that can be proven right there under a microscope. Uh, so what one of the quotes is, um, when those trained in the respective disciplines of medicine, philosophy, and theology are unable to arrive at any consensus, the judiciary at this point in the development of man's knowledge is not in a position to speculate as to the answer. Well, we had known for years that life begins at conception, and it's, and it's even uh, proven to a greater degree, even now, all these years later, after Roe v. Wade. That one, to me, is just so obvious that, um, well, yeah, anyway, here's a great quote from Dr., I think his last name is Obrich, he's an MD, uh, board certified, OBGYN, and he said, human development is a continuous process that begins, you know, being conception, when uh, the ovum from a female is fertilized by the sperm from a male. And so, human life, we know, begins at conception. And, it, you know, it's, 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 not, it's not not life. I mean, it's nothing else but life, because there's no such thing as a fertilized egg, because when it's a fertilized egg, then we have a zygote, and that's the, the there you go, that's, the, that's a new life. So number two, um, I mean, to me, the science part of this, and you got to keep in mind, back then they said, oh, it's just tissue. You know, it's not a baby, it's just tissue, or a blob of tissue. Well, again, bald-faced lie. You know, the science stacks against them. We now know uh, that it's, it's a human being, and within just a matter of days uh, that, that, the, that the heart can be detected. I wish I had that data in front of me. I want to say it was somewhere around like the 19th day with the right technology they can detect the heartbeat. But moving along, point number two, abortion is health care involving a normal, healthy physician-patient relationship. That's not true. Uh, you know, most, ab uh, abortionists, most abortionists haven't even met their patients when they come into the room to do the abortion. Um, you know, and usually they're walking in with a mask on their face, and the woman has never even conversed with that doctor before. And so that there's, not, there's no part of a normal, healthy relationship. Uh, let's see, while the citable examples are legion, but former abortionist doctor, uh, his name is Sudmak, ex explains the lack of doctor-patient relationship in an abortion clinic. And this is his quote. He says, I would like to believe all doctors share a genuine concern for the health and well-being of their patients. The doctor-patient relationship is unique, one that started on the first visit and develops over the course of time. Well, in an abortion clinic, there is no doctor-patient relationship. The doctor enters the room. There's a brief introduction. The patient's already on the table, ready to have the procedure done. There's no sort of opportunity for any sort of a meaningful relationship to develop. And this is, just, to me, it's just so sad. And it says, in the most definitive statewide study of the matter, this is based on a study done in South Dakota, uh, the state of South Dakota concluded, we find that the process which results in the pregnant mother signing the consent form and making her decision before ever seeing or speaking to an abortion doctor is incompatible with the principles of a doctor's duty to see that the patient's decision is informed before she consents to an operative procedure. We find that there's no true physician-patient relationship, and once that decision's been made, the, the woman is seeing the doctor not for counseling, consultation, or help in reaching a decision, but rather to submit to the medical procedure that she's already committed to, whether or not it was informed. Because you, you got to keep in mind, a lot of these women have no clue that they're killing an existing human being. They've been told it's a blob of tissue, so there's no informed consent. So, that, so that's fallacy number two that the court made, that, that, that this is all done based on a normal, healthy doctor-patient relationship. That's bullcrap. Number three, uh, motherhood and child-rearing forces upon the woman a distressful, life and future. Well, that's not true. I mean, what we do know now is that abortion, as I've already highlighted, 
has caused much stress. I mean, the thing that they did not take into account is what happens to the women emotionally uh, when, when after they've had abortions. So we know drug, you know, uh, drug addictions, alcohol addictions, um, more promiscuity, uh, depression, uh, suicide attempts. I mean, that's all well documented. There's a massive increase in suicide attempts. Uh, let's see, what else? Oh, then physically. I mean, physically, now, here we are. The United States of America, and since abortion's been legalized, guess what's been increasing? The number of preterm deliveries. Well, why is that? Well, if that woman's had one, two, three abortions, and then she goes for a full-term pregnancy, her cervix, had, which had been jacked wide open for an abortion, forced to be opened, you know, against its will, okay, during an abortion, it's now weakened, okay? A cervix should not be forced open with an abortion. But if that woman's had one, two, three abortions, it's now weakened her cervix. So when I think of Senator Dine Feinstein, maybe she's post-abortive herself, I don't know. But sitting there fighting for these reproductive rights, and yet she won't even sit there and admit what the pitfalls are of legalized abortion. Ah, it just, it angers me. And so, now the other thing, okay, so this motherhood and child rearing forces upon the woman a distressful life and, and future. In the, well, okay, in the Planned Parenthood versus Casey, a court case, the court reiterated that the woman's right to an abortion was predicated upon the fact that the inability to provide for the nurture and care of the infant is a cruelty to the child and an anguish to the parent. Well, here, we're going to bust this thing wide open. Have you ever heard of safe haven laws? Safe haven laws. These were not, I don't know, if maybe some states had these back in 1973. But uh, what we now know is that all 50 states have safe haven laws. You can Google this. There's, um, I should have opened that up, but there's a website that literally gives you all 50 states, and you can take your uh, mouse and you hover over the state and it'll tell you specifically what the law is, the safe haven laws, that mothers can drop their children off. If the mother feels like, I cannot raise this child, it's too much, I can't afford it, I'm too stressed out, I'm too this, I'm too that, I just can't do it. She, she's not forced to keep that baby. In all 50 states, she can drop that baby off at either, either all or either a police station, a hospital, or a fire department and sometimes like a rescue squad station. Okay, she can literally drop that child off and at every state, you know, some of these states the laws are different. Some some states she has, you know, whatever, two weeks after delivery. Sometimes it's up to one year. So she could literally uh, drop off, you know, a one-year-old baby um, at, a, at a hospital or, you know, the fire department. So so this idea that that which is foundational to Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which oh the the left loves to hold on to Planned Parenthood versus Casey, uh, but we've just driven a Mack truck through that because what they depend on is like oh it's so unfair to make this mother you know raise her child. Well you know on one hand it's kind of sad that the state has now. Um, washed her of her responsibility, but that is what, what's happened. So on the good side, there's no reason now for any woman to have to kill her baby. If she finds herself pregnant, she doesn't want to be pregnant, in all 50 states, she can go take that baby and drop that baby off at one of those facilities I just mentioned. So that's point number three. Point number four, so the decision to have an abortion would truly be voluntary and informed. Well, we've already exposed now that, that it's not an informed decision, that many times the women are completely misled. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know it's a baby. They don't know uh, that there's a heartbeat. They don't know that the baby already has little hands and fingers and, uh, you know, developed, you know, by the 12th week. They don't know that by the end of the 12th week when, let's face it, many abortions happen, that baby is, um, is formed all the reproductive organs, not reproductive, all the organs, all the systems are in place. I mean, you think about this, it's beautiful. You think about from, from conception to just 12 weeks later, 
all the systems are in place from that point forward the baby just has to mature and get bigger and mature all those systems uh, and organs but everything's there and so so the idea that the, the, the patients inform we already know that's not true uh, but the decision to have an abortion would truly be voluntary uh, not so what we now know is that because because of making abortion legal and you know something Diane Feinstein would hate to have to admit to this it's put the power in the man's hands so now that father of that baby let's say it's a boyfriend girlfriend relationship and it was just a it doesn't even matter you know a, a one night stand or maybe it's been a long-term relationship but the point is is that boyfriend now uh, the father of that child can now pressure that woman he can coerce her many times you know whether it be physically emotionally you know financially any of the reasons he can scare her into having an abortion he can coerce her and it's one thing if it's illegal and he's trying to coerce her you know he doesn't really have a leg to stand on but now that the fact that it's legal so what we do know is that many many women across the united states uh, were coerced into having abortions i'm going to read one part from uh, a 2005 report on abortion in South Dakota and it concluded that the Roe court incorrectly assumed that the abortion decision is truly voluntary and informed quote we received and reviewed the testimony of more than 1940 women who have had abortions this stunning and heart-wrenching testimony reveals that there are common experiences with abortions women were not told the truth about abortion they were misled into thinking that nothing but tissue was being removed and relate that they would not have had an abortion if they had been told the truth. They relate that they were coerced into having the abortion by the father of the child or a parent and that the abortion clinics also apply pressure to have the abortion. They almost uniformly express anger toward the abortion providers their baby's father or society in general which promote abortion as a great right the exercise of which is good for women. They almost invariably state that they were, they were encouraged to have an abortion by the mere fact that it was legal. They were stunned by their grief and the negative impact it had had on their lives. Many of these women are angered by grief at the loss of a child they were never told even existed. One woman testified before the task force as of South Dakota about three abortions she was misled into having only to find that she was rendered infertile by the vacuum aspiration that damaged her fallopian tubes. She was distraught at having to explain to her new husband why they could never have children. Each of these women's stories is powerful. The overwhelming majority of women testified that they would never have considered an abortion if it were not legal. Their testimony revealed that they feel that the legalization of abortion simply gave a license to others to pressure them into a decision they otherwise would not have made. Most of the women stated that abortion should not be legal. This is coming from 1,940 women, the vast majority of them stating that abortion should not be legal and they've all had at least one abortion. Senator Dine Feinstein, it's time to be accountable. You're lying through your pearly white teeth that you're standing up for women and women's rights. You're not. You're sending, you're, uh, you're sending them into a life of shame, misery, physical illness, emotional illness, drug addictions, you know, suicide attempts. It's so, so sad. This thing is so based on lies. But you know what? Right then I'm thinking of you know, the words of Jesus Christ, that he came to give us life and to give us life abundant. And then he goes on to say that the evil one, of course he's talking about Satan himself, comes to kill, deceive, and destroy and that my friends is the abortion industry that's exactly it's a perfect description it, it comes to kill deceive and destroy all right I will be right back we're gonna finish up uh, with two more erroneous assumptions of the Supreme Court and we will be going over the eight-point strategy of Dr. Bernard Nathanson and and we'll be exposing a tad bit more about the Kavanaugh 
um, hearing some a few things that you really should know about and some fantastic quotes from the founder, from the father of America's abortion industry who wanted you to know uh, the truth of how he deceived and duped our Supreme Court and the public and our doctors and our justices, the clergy and millions of men and women. Don't go anywhere. I'll be right back. Think back to the last time you felt healthy and energized. The best times of our lives occur when we're at the peak of our health, sleeping better, full of energy and focus. We know that fades with age, and you might be feeling the effects of aging as low energy and poor sleep. But it doesn't have to be that way. There haven't been any nutrition systems designed to rejuvenate our bodies as we get older until now. Healthy Cell Pro is the only multinutrient system that impacts the building block of your body, the cell. Created by anti-aging expert and Nobel Prize nominee, Dr. Vincent Giampapa, award-winning Healthy Cell Pro cuts through the complexity of nutrition supplements by simply giving you the purest ingredients, filling dietary gaps to nourish your cells and enhance your quality of life for optimal performance. Visit HealthyCell.com and use code OUTLOUD for an exclusive discount or call 844-869-9958. All right, we're going to wrap up the last two erroneous assumptions the Supreme Court made. Uh, Number five is that abortion is safe and mortality risk less than pregnancy. Uh, Just let it be known that they were relying on a faulty um, research report um, that's been proven uh, that the research report they were relying on and the 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 chapter in my book that that paragraph ends with in short the Roe court's assumption that induced abortion is safer than childbirth could likely only be validated today based on faulty scientific methodologies and incomplete data and is in any case limited to the period immediately after childbirth or termination of pregnancy. It completely ignores four data linkage studies which are based on a far more objective and neutral methodology as well as complete and reliable data. Those and other studies effectively explode the myth that abortion is safer for a woman than childbirth. You can read all about it. It's point number five. And then point number six, which you almost have to laugh at, the assumption that women face significant difficulties as a result of a cultural stigma of unwed motherhood. Unwed motherhood now, because of multiple different reasons, uh, which I can probably highlight some of those, but unwed motherhood today, that's common. So there is no cultural stigma anymore of an unwed mother. Uh, you know, some of the factors that led to this, you've got Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, spreading her gospel of promiscuity, and then in the, you know, 50s, her worldview, uh, partnering up with the worldview of Dr. Alfred Kinsey, paving the way for the cultural sexual revolution of 1960s, and so, you know, one thing leading to another, now we've got you know, our children in school being indoctrinated with the worldview of Margaret Sanger, uh, which is all about promiscuity. So, which leads, of course, to pregnancy. Sex, you know, will eventually lead many times to pregnancy. So, so there we've got it. The six erroneous assumptions the Supreme Court made back in 1973. I'm going to read all six of these um, together. Here it is. We can't know when a human being we can't, we can't know what a human being is and when its life begins. False. Uh, abortion is health care involving a normal, responsible doctor-patient relationship. False. Motherhood and child-rearing force upon the woman a distressful life and future. False. Remember, those uh, um, baby Moses laws, those safe haven laws in all 50 states. An abortion decision is truly voluntary and fully informed. False. The risk to a woman's health and life was far greater in carrying the child to full term than in having an abortion, false, and a woman faces significant difficulties as a result of a cultural stigma of unwed motherhood. B-O-L-O-G-N-A, baloney. The Supreme Court made horrible assumptions which have led to the death of 60 million women, which have led to the rise in breast cancer, which have led to uh, premature 
uh, uh, deliveries because of the weakened cervix. It has led to uh, increased violence, increased public turmoil, and the disintegration of the American family. Now, where do those last three things come from? They come from the resignation letter of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. This is why I'd like to sit down with Senator Dianne Feinstein. I'd like to have had the opportunity to read his resignation letter uh, at that um, at Brett Kavanaugh's hearing, because in that letter he warns, he warns that if, uh, as long as abortion is legal, we will see increased violence, increased public turmoil, and the disintegration of the American family. Uh, the, the, you know, the other thing I'm thinking of is, is the license that it's given so many men. I mean, this thing is so upside down. So Diane Feinstein, you know, sitting up there grandstanding, you know, Miss Feminist herself, spewing the lies of maintaining legalized abortion without even fessing up that legalized abortion puts the license in the man's hands, in the father's hands, to coerce the woman into having an abortion. I mean, he can almost hold a gun to her head because it's the law. It's legal, so go get it done. It, it, so Americans, you, I, obviously you can hear my frustration and my voice. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, let me tell you a little bit about him because he's the father of the abortion industry. He paved the way with eight points of propaganda to, to have abortion legalized. So, so in his organization, NARAL, the legal counsel for NARAL, just so you know, he wrote two articles. One of, uh, at least one, was cited in that Supreme Court case, Roe v. Wade, uh, where they basically, he rewrote jurisprudence history, making it look like abortion had always been legal, that it was always supported. Um, <clears throat> and it was a bald-faced lie. I don't have enough time here today to go over that whole backstory. But, but you can d dig into it, you can research it, it's all out there. Uh, but let, let's go over the eight-point strategy of Dr. Bernard Nathanson. So it's the late 1960s. Dr. Nathanson is uh, wa wanting to, he's now the, the medical director for, for, he's on the board of directors for NARAL, and he's their medical director. They come out with an eight-point propaganda campaign to deceive the American public. The first thing is they want to frame it around um, uh, the debate is around just choice, just choice, just like you've got a choice of orange juice and a choice of um, what house to buy. Well, this is just a, a choice. It's a medical choice. That's number one. Number two, that it was a, um, a decision between a woman and her doctor. So they frame these cynical slogans, okay? It's a decision between a woman and her doctor. It's just a medical decision. Um, so they pivoted away from abortion is the intentional killing of a baby in the womb, you know, to extract that baby out of the womb for the purpose of killing that baby, of destroying his life. Um, so, so we got framing the debate, and then we got the cynical slogans, and then he used the complicit media. Dr. Nathanson used the media uh, who, who would take anything he would tell them, and then they would report it as the truth. So that's the fourth element, is they, they use the media, and then the lies were repeated often and you know often and well in the media so it almost sounded like the truth or it did sound like the truth well what would he tell them he would tell them that a million women a year are having back alley abortions and 5,000 to 10,000 women a year are dying the real numbers were about 99 to 100,000 women a year were having illegal abortions and again the number of women dying was about 200 at the high side and we've already talked about that in the, in the first segment uh, let's see, the other thing he would say is that 60% of Americans want abortion on demand legalized. 60%. I mean, you would think this is, you know, that the, the everybody across America, 60%. Well, when I met with Dr. Nathanson, I said, where did you get the 60% number? And he said, Terry, he said, I pulled it out of thin air. He said, we knew we had to be over 50%. You know, we were advised by a PR firm that if you're really trying to create a revolution, you've got to be able to qu quote statistics over 50%. So it was a bald-faced lie. Now, you may be wondering why these people were so comfortable lying. Well, because they were all atheists. They, they, I mean, if, if, with that atheist worldview, they have nobody to be accountable to one day. They, well, at least they think they don't. They don't think that one day when they die, they're going to be standing in front of the Lord 
and having to give an account for what they've done, for their sin in their own lifetime. And so lying was just part of the formula to get them from point A to point B. And this is very um, appropriate, very um, descriptive of the majority of their worldview, which is quite frankly a Marxist worldview. Betty Friedan, she was one of the partners. She founded the National Organization of Women. She was a Marxist, communist. And then you have Lawrence Later. He, he worked for the first card-carrying communist on Capitol Hill. Lawrence Later, as far as I'm concerned, he was a Marxist communist. Dr. Nathanson was not a communist, but he agreed with the lying. He agreed that, you know, they had to lie to, to get their, uh, to get their, uh, to move their message forward. And so, so those were the lies. He would give false statistics, false, um, all that false data. They would repeat it. They would use the media. They would always frame it around choice. They used the, the slogans, my body, my choice, all that kind of stuff. And then lastly, the eighth point is they used the Catholic strategy. The Catholic, they had to have a political victory in the voting booth. They had to make sure enough people would vote for pro-abortion candidates. And, um, and actually, before I finish that thought on the Catholic strategy, I've got a great quote right here from Dr. Nathanson. Um, he wrote in his book, uh, let's see, the, um, uh, the Hand of God, he said, I confess that I knew that the figures were totally false, and I suppose that others did too, if they stopped to think of it, but in the, quote, morality of our revolution, it was a useful figure, widely accepted. The overriding concern was to get the laws eliminated, the laws, you know, against abortion, and anything within reason that had to be done was permissible, okay? That's what happens when, uh, when, when you put God over here and say, you know, God doesn't matter, and th these people lie to get to where they want to go. So the last thing is they lied to the American Catholics. Uh, ca Catholic doctrine, 100% uh, from the beginning of the church, um, never, ever, ever supported abortion or infanticide. And so what they did was they used the Catholic strategy. Uh, which was eight points. They would blame the Pope, the Cardinals, the Bishops, the local priests anytime a woman died of an illegal abortion. Secondly, they would emphasize um, the any Catholic politicians or candidates who were, uh, or the politicians who were weakening, softening their position against abortion. If they were coming over to NARAL's side, boy, they would emphasize those people in the media. Uh, the, third, they would support they would support those candidates during the political campaigns that if they were for abortion, they would support them, door knocking, pamphleteering, advertising. And then lastly, they did the Catholic straddle because uh, they knew they wouldn't get all the Catholics to support abortion. Like, hey, it's a woman's right to choose and they would feel good about it. They knew, uh, they knew there's a, still a huge swath of Catholics who were totally personally abhorrent toward abortion. Uh, but they wanted those Catholics to go into the voting booth and make sure they still voted for a pro-abortion candidate. So they came up with a straddle. And the straddle is so commonplace that most people don't even know that it was a political ploy. In fact, Dr. Nathanson called it the most brilliant political strategy of all time, these four things I'm putting together. But the straddle was you can remain personally against abortion but still vote for that pro-abortion candidate because, you know, every woman deserves the right to choose. So that was the straddle. You, you don't have to, you know, love abortion. You can be, you can remain personally against it, but you pivot. And, and, and but every woman deserves the right to choose. So vote for that pro-abortion candidate or don't let this abortion issue stand in your way of supporting a pro-abortion candidate. And that, my friends, is the eight-point strategy that Dr. Nathanson, the co-founder of NARAL, used to pave the way, the cultural way, for the Roe v. Wade decision. And this in combination with the article that the legal counsel for NARAL wrote, which was basically rewriting American jurisprudence history about the history of abortion. He made it look like that abortion laws were always on the books in favor of you know, protecting the woman's right to have an abortion, which was a bald-faced lie. 
And so this was part of the deception. And so I swing back to Senator Dianne Feinstein, who can sit there at that hearing looking at, you know, this brilliant judge. And, you know, and I, you know, of course, I'm praying that, that he is a, a pro-life judge and he's willing to, uh, you know, with the right court case to re-examine all these different things. You know, because how can precedent be set when precedent was all based on lies? How can you, how can you, it, to me it's just, it's unfathomable thinking that this poor woman, Norma McCorvey, couldn't even get the Supreme Court to re-examine the Roe v. Wade case. And yet, she was so used, she was so manipulated. And then, when we have someone like Dr. Bernard Nathanson, I pretty much have this quote memorized, but for the sake of not making a mistake, I'm going to read this, but just take in his words. You know, Dr. Nathanson in the abortion papers book, he explains all of the, you know, the propaganda and the lies that I just went over, that eight-point strategy. And at the end, the book ends with this quote. And this is the father of America's abortion industry who paved the way for Roe v. Wade. He says, I believe the abortion ethic is fatally and forever flawed by the immorality of the means of its victory, a political victory achieved by such odious tactics is at best an unstable tyranny spawned by an unscrupulous and unprincipled minority. At the very least, this disclosure of those odious tactics should compel those who are uneasy with permissive abortion to re-examine the issue. I believe that an America which permits a junta of moral thugs to foist an evil of incalculable dimensions upon it and continues to permit that evil to flower creates for itself a deadly legacy, a millennium of shame. Isn't that the most profound, you know, closing statement? So he's he's laid it all out. He's saying he's saying America, I used to be a moral thug. I was one of its leaders. And this has been a political victory, you know, achieved by deceiving people with odious tactics. And then he's saying, you know, what, what are we creating? If we do not rectify this, if we don't fix this, you know, so I submit to you, we need a Supreme Court where the majority of, of justices will re-examine all of this. I pray that the right court case will come along and um, in fact, in fact, we're getting ready to launch a petition uh, to the to the White House and make sure you 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 see this. It'll be on the Jose Initiative, but it's it'll be a petition uh, petitioning the White House, petitioning our president um, to place a moratorium on abortion until until all the, until all the the court reexamines whether or not a fetus is a living child. Okay, so so you know because now there's you know there's such question. Of course, all the science stacks in our favor, but it's like the Roe v. Wade is saying, "Gee, that you know there wasn't any kind of consensus that that this is a baby." So who are we, the Supreme Court, to make such a decision? If the theologians can't figure this out, if the medical community, which of course back then it already had, but that this is what's on the books. So I say. Let's ask the White House if we can raise 100,000 signatures so that that petition gets sent to the president to place a moratorium on abortion. Stop it. Stop it. Just like if there was a building, a big city building that was going to be taken down. The building is all rigged up with the dynamite and all that ready to implode. But wait a minute. The evidence or there, there's a suggestion or some evidence or whatever you want to call it, that women, we think there's a family, um, a, a mom in there with a cup, you know, a homeless mom with some kids. You know, we saw them. They were just in there yesterday. You know, and they, in fact, they said they weren't leaving. You know, are they going to light that dynamite? Are they going to implode that building and take a chance that they would actually be killing a child or children uh, or child children and possibly a mother? Of course not. They're not going to ignite the dynamite. They're not going to press the go button. They're going to be sending in the the dogs to to sniff it out to find out. You know, is there is there human life in here? And if there is, that building's not coming down. 
So the analogy is, let's put a halt to Roe v. Wade. Let's put a halt to Planned Parenthood versus Casey because women are no longer dependent on killing their children because they, in all 50 states, they can, they can um, provide a future and a hope for their children by placing that child at a fire station, at a police department, at a hospital. Of course, it all depends on, on what state and which rules, but every pregnant woman across America has no reason to ever, ever kill her child because she doesn't want to raise that child. And so with that thought, I'm going to sign off. Um, am I fired up? You bet. And, and I, I encourage you to get my book. Get the, get the book. Get, you can go into the bookstore right here on America Out Loud. Get my book called What If We've Been Wrong? Keeping My Promise to America's Abortion King. And let's set the record straight once and for all. I'm tired of the lies. I'm tired of the Senator Dianne Feinsteins and everybody on the left. And I'm tired of the weak-kneed Republicans who say they're pro-life and then they don't do anything about it. It's like somebody get a spine. Somebody get a spine and do the right thing and um, and let's set the record straight and let's let's build a culture of love and a culture of life and with that I'll sign off and I look forward to talking to you next time <music>